Patricia Wang. She is a technology ethnographer, which I, I love that term, makes you, makes you really think. Um, she's the co-founder of Sudden Compass, where she's been helping um, enterprises um, unlock opportunities in their big data. So she's really bringing a human lens to data um, and helping companies uh, to get the most out of their data. Uh, she's worked with companies like um, P&G, Kickstarter, Spotify, GE, um, and she's also been an IDEO expert in residence um, in the past, so she's been doing a lot of things. And one of the reasons why I was so excited to invite Trisha here is um, how you bring and utilize data in a sprint is really, really critical to the outcomes. And I have struggled with that myself as a sprint master, um, figuring out different ways to do that and how to make the most of um, our data. And um, uh, you know, empowering and, and giving sprint masters new ways to think about that, new ways to think about um, collecting that data and answering those questions. So I'm very excited for Trisha to be bringing her perspective here. Um, and if you could all join me in welcoming her. Thank you. Um, thank you, Kai, for that generous introduction. It's really great to be here in this community. Um, I think these kind of spaces are actually really rare. I don't know about you guys, but I go to a lot of conferences, and they're usually big and impersonal. But to have something this small and curated is really lovely. And I have not been to something like this in a while. So thank you to Kai and her team for organizing this. And you guys have brought really amazing people here. Um, I want to be clear that I am not a sprint master or I'm, I'm not a master facilitator. Um, you guys do this for your living. And you got, there's a real art and science to this. And many of you I've learned from and have watched over the years. So I want to first say thank you. Uh, we just happen at my company to use a sprint-based approach, but we don't sell sprints as part of our work. So I want to be clear that I'm really here to learn from you guys. But what Kai has asked me to do is um, to really share kind of our approach. So I think it's a bit unfair that you know this is me talking for most of the time. So we'll, I hope that we can talk afterwards about what resonated with you, what could you bring back into your approach. And if you have um, questions or anything that strikes you or pictures, feel free to, this is my Instagram handle and my Twitter handle, um, can be reachable there also. So usually uh, my talks are about the importance of understanding human beings when building technology products and showing organizations the destructiveness of what happens when they over rely on quantification. So today, but today, instead of talking about how we as a society have arrived at this point of quantification, and instead of talking about why it is so important to not engage in over quantification, I'm gonna take a different route. I'm gonna talk about what we do at Set and Compass to solve this problem. Kai, uh, being as convincing as she is, said that this was truly a safe space of practitioners um, who would want to understand actually the guts of what we, to, what we do, because I'm pretty allergic to any time consultants come up and talk about this is like what we do in our process, but she swore to me like this is a pay place where you know, this would be welcomed. Um, so I'm gonna share a bit about what we do to help enterprises work with data and to solve business problems in a human-centric way. And her ask was really well-timed because our goal this year at Set and Compass was to open source some of the practices that we've been testing and refining over the last five years. And now we really want to make this available for anyone, anywhere in the world to leverage it. So usually while we only reserve these kind of things for one-on-one -on -one discussions with our partners or potential partners, we're really excited to share this in a community. And so after this, we'll be uh, working with Kai and her team to put our stuff up on the Google Design Sprint site so that you guys can um, make use of this. So I want to start off my talk today with this question of how do we empower humans in a data-centric data -centric and data-driven world? And this is essentially the one question that we obsess over at Set and Compass. Uh, my partners and I, we've been working to answer this question with companies ranging from startups to you know, Fortune 50 companies. But our story does not start with data. It starts with donuts. Um, I had been business dating for a few years, um, searching for the perfect uh, business partner. And after being ghosted and disappointed by several people, you know, one of my good friends said, Trisha, don't give up. There is a perfect business partner out there for you. And I think you should talk to my best friend. So Jason Lee said, my best friend is Matt LeMay. 
And he loves talking about data all the time. And he also has seen some of the problems you've seen. I'm like, how is that possible? So I arranged for you know, the first uh, chat to happen at uh, Doe. And has anyone been to Doe in, yes, a few people. So is it not the best donut like this, in the world, right? It is seriously the best source of donuts. It's in Brooklyn, Bed-Stuy, New York City. If you're ever there, please call me up. I live down the street from there. And I made a rule that the only way I can go there is if I take someone new to introduce them to Doe. Because <laughs> the first year it opened, I'd be like, oh, I have to walk by Doe. And so this is Matt's face when he took his first bite of the donut. Clearly, it's like the O oh, donut face, you know? And he agreed from that point on. And so we, from that point on, we've been talking about donuts and data ever since. And if you haven't had the pleasure of meeting Matt in person, you might recognize his two excellent books that he's written about some of our work. And Matt's background, as you may have guessed from the second book here, is in product management. And mine is what's known as traditionally known as research. And while the work we had been doing is so different, it comes from different parts of the companies, the overall trends we were observing of what was happening in the modern enterprise, and also in startups when I say modern enterprises, I'm also including startups, were shockingly similar. You know, we both saw organizations talking really big games about innovation and technology, but falling back into like business as usual, you know, focusing mostly on the reality of just optimization. So companies were like being like, we're gonna disrupt business as usual. But really what they ended up doing was just like, we're gonna optimize business as usual. And as a researcher, the way I was seeing it was that, you know, I saw companies heavily investing in big data tools that were only used to optimize their existing business model and rather than actually engaging in entirely new customers in a new way. And I saw budgets for anything, anything that was just qualitative being slashed and just being given straight over to quantitative. And in particular, at the beginning of my career, uh, I quickly realized that businesses usually don't put researchers in a strategic role to drive growth, which, I, which is why I created this new title called Tech Ethnographer, because I thought it's better to create confusion than to have them put me in a box of a researcher. Because <laughs> at least they have to be like, why? What does that mean? And if you don't ask me why, I just know that they didn't listen to what I said at all, because no one knows what a tech ethnographer is. I made it up. Mm -hmm. and so. And then as a PM, Matt was seeing companies over rely on A-B testing and other optimization methodologies. You know, he had been uh, an API evangelist at Bitly, had led, you know, songs that through their acquisition by Google, and he's seen it all. So rather than, you know, he saw that rather than using you know, tech data to discover new, you know, to really discover customer problems and to solve them, he just saw that companies were using data to optimize their existing business. So the real quick, I'm, I'm curious, raise your hand if your organization loves to talk about innovation. Okay, so half of at least the room. And raise your hand if you feel like that the reality of your day-to-day -day work lives up to this rhetoric. One person so far, what's your name? We should actually tell everyone who you are. What's your name? Wait, can I see your name? What's your name? John. John what? We need your last name. Alonji. Alonji, where are you from? What organization are you with? <laughs> I make video here, right? Oh, so your organization lives up to, that's amazing. So Google lives up to the reality. But not, I, not many, oh, I'm sorry. I thought no, you said I you make videos video. here. I, I work at Cisco System. Oh, you work at Cisco, great. So that is amazing that Cisco is doing this. So we should all be talking to John Alonji afterwards. I hope you all saw his face. Most of us don't work at organizations usually where that the talk, you know, the actual actions lives up to reality. And if you look around, you know, you're, you'll see for the people who didn't raise their hand, which is like 99.99% of the room, is that we're not alone. You know, this is something that a lot of people and organizations are struggling with. And if innovation was just seriously like that easy of a problem to solve by throwing more money, you know, more data at it, then we would have solved it. We would have totally solved innovation by now. Because throwing money at data and technology is easy. Just about every single company in the world is doing this through some kind of project, through some kind of digital transformation work. But more data and more technology does not mean more innovation. Now I wanna be clear, I know this is a super controversial statement. You have to understand it's not easy to walk in, like talk about courage with you know, what Kai opened up the first day with. Like walk into a company and telling them that, hey, all those things you're doing, throwing more data and technology, it, it may not actually make you better or more innovative. This is really controversial. And this is the, 
this is, if you look at some of my other talks aligned, this is the core message I work on, and which is the topic of my upcoming book. And so if this is something that is very controversial. I'm not going to go into why, but what I want to leave, maybe just leave one thing with to say, explain why this is the case, is our friend uh, Matt Chase-Glausi, one of the awesome you know, companies in the world, Pinboard, has pointed out one very clear example that proves this, you know, that shows how this is true. And he, he talks about the pharma pharmaceutical industry. You know, they, he talks about how the big pharma is, has been seeing a decrease in their ROI in, other, in their investments. So even though pharma is putting more money into drug innovation, less drugs are being developed. How can this be? Right? They were putting more money, more technology against this problem. And the answer is in the logic of Arum's law, which is Moore's law spelled backwards. <laughs> <laughs> and just as a quick refresher, we all know Moore's law, you know, where it's, it's Moore's law saying, hey, look, processor speeds double in, you know, every two years in proportion to the money that we invest in chip development, right? So essentially Moore's law is saying, hey, the more you spend on you know, innovation, the faster chips become, okay? So that's Moore's law in red. What, it, what a room's law says is that drug development decreases every nine years. So the more you invest in drugs, right? The more you invest in drugs, the less drugs you get. And the reasons for this are multiple and complex. And it's quite plausible to be like, hey, Trisha, yeah, that's just like big pharma. There's like a lot of regulation there. So that's like a little different from what we do, where it's like less regulation. But I would say, look, we're seeing this across the board. This is the trend in every single industry. According to research from Anne Marie Knott, a professor of strategy at Washington University, her work shows that returns from investments in R&D have declined 65% over the past three decades. This is an alarming number <laughs> because this means that no matter how much we pour into innovation of digital transformation, of doing sprint sports, of being more agile, being more lean, something is falling short. How can we be so into innovation and be getting less out of it? And you know, Mar Anne Marie's answer, her short answer for why this is happening comes from her book where she says, look, you know, in her book, How Innovation Really Works, the answer is simple. She's like, Companies have gotten worse at innovation. That's the simple answer. Now, innovation looks a lot like pharma, even for non-pharma companies. And the reason for that is actually really, really simple. With so much at stake, with so much customer unpredictability, and with the size of the enterprises, and especially if you're also a startup, with, the, you know, with so much capital and risk you've taken on, it's oftentimes just easier for companies to invest in optimizing things that they already know work than to try to discover new things altogether. So pharmaceutical companies, like many modern enterprises, are stuck in the trap of optimizing existing solutions and calling it innovation. The inability to break out of optimization is directly related to another challenge that we see at companies, is that all these companies are claiming to be data-driven. Everyone is really excited to say, we're now a data-driven company. And what that often means is we're quantitatively data-driven. It does not mean that they're insight-driven. There's a humongous difference between being data-driven and insight-driven. I'm not gonna get into those details now. Those are part of other talks, but the point is, is that when companies talk about data-driven, they only are referring to quantitative data. And this means that anything qualitatively new, anything that can't show up in their existing models, anything that doesn't fit in a spreadsheet, like smiles or tears or stories or trust, you know, we've been talking a lot about that, that doesn't fit in a spreadsheet. Anything that's emergent like that, it can't be seen at all. And they wonder why they struggle at innovation. And now I've encountered this bias towards the quantifiable a lot in my career. Um, here's one example I keep coming back to that really made me have the aha moment. It was back in 2008 and I was working as a researcher for Nokia. I'm not going to go into the story now. I'm gonna give you the one minute version. You can find the full story up online as it's a, it's a case study I've talked about extensively. But the 30 second story is that I was sent to China when I was working at Nokia and R&D to gather qualitative data to understand you know, what customers wanted. 
And Nokia sent me there, and I went there, and here are some pictures of, from my field work of doing ethnographic qualitative work. I worked as a dumpling seller, I worked as a street vendor, I lived in slums, I worked, lived with construction workers, trying to understand second, secondhand cell phone markets. And let me tell you, if you were me, you know, if you had been there, you would have seen it too. It couldn't have been more obvious that Nokia was going to go out of business because people would not want to buy smartphones in a few years. And so I went to Nokia and I told them that. I said, look, you're going to go out of business in a few years. And I did it, of course, much more diplomatically and strategically. But I essentially said, here's all my studies, here's all my research, and here's my business plan for what you can do to start experimenting with a new business model of working on smartphones. And they were like, you're crazy. You know, the iPhone had just come out in 2009, and they were like, the iPhone's a fad. A lot of smart people thought that. And look, they said, we have millions of customer data points from marketing, from analytics, from our BI apartments. Not one single person is telling us that our business model has to change and that our customers, because we're number one in the market, are going to want to buy smartphones. And I was like, of course, because I've been collecting qualitative data that's beyond your existing business model. So of course, I'm looking at stuff that's invisible, that's unknown, and that's emergent. So it's okay, let's work together and let's actually start validating kind of the stuff I'm seeing. But they're like, no, no, no. And I left. We all know how the story of Nokia ends. You know, By the time that their quantitative models have been adjusted to account for emergent qualitative insights, it was too late. Right? So imagine, imagine what would have happened if Nokia could have accomplished you know, using qual and quant together to become insight driven. Imagine what would have happened. You know, I think there would have, they would have been the first to pick up that there's a demand for smartphones in China. And maybe we would all be doing a Nokia Sprints conference today instead of Google Sprints. I mean, who knows, right? But we'll never know because what I came to realize, you know, through my experience at Nokia, that it was not unique to me or to Nokia, that this was so widespread, this problem of not being able to understand anything that didn't exist in a mathematical model. I gave it a name, and it's called the quantification bias. And then this is the topic of the book I'm writing. And this is a bias. This is a modern bias that is specific to the data-driven environment of enterprises and businesses. That is, the unconscious belief of valuing the measurable over the immeasurable. And we often see it in our work. It's when someone becomes so focused on the measurable that they can't even pay attention to any evidence, even if you put it in front of their face. You know, I studied this a lot in one of my first jobs at NASA. This is something I've talked a lot about with this Challenger space, crash, space shuttle crash, that the quantification bias is something that you know, also play large companies like NASA. And I saw it then later on in my career when I ended at Nokia and then other companies. And has anyone, do you, has anyone ever experienced a quantification bias in your work? Yes, it's like when you know, you know you've seen something and then someone's like, oh, could you put it into a PowerPoint with a chart? <laughs> could you put some numbers and get a statistics on it? And so the, this is like a, such a big problem that I think like we need to talk about this much more openly because it's preventing us from actually doing really great work with clients and, with our, and within our companies. So it was odd to see the quantification bias much relatedly, you know, so, and much relatedly with, it was weird at the same time because then companies that we were working with, including Nokia, you know, this is like 10 years ago, but including Nokia, they were talking about customer obsession. And I was like, how is it that companies can be so data driven quantitatively and then at the same time be like, we're innovative and we're totally obsessed with the customer? How can that live in the same world? But actually what it seemed like they really cared about was more about tools, frameworks and technologies that they were using to you know, understand about their customers. And if your company you know, has ever spent months evaluating a technology tool without once taking into account the impact the tool will have on the customers, if any, then you might, you might have fallen into this trap or you might have witnessed your clients falling into this trap. And indeed, in many organizations, they undergo a digital transformation and they actually wind up farther away from their customers because of this, because they're so obsessed with getting the right tool. So here's a tool that, I mean, here's a circle on your left that represents the modern organization, right? There's a hierarchy, there's structure, there's departments, and there's silos. And in this kind of model, you know, the people at the bottom report up and the people at the top make all decisions. Where do you see the customer in this? Outside the circle, and I heard at the bottom. That is correct. And what do you think happens when a company-centric organization like this 
adds digital tools and says, we're going to be innovative. We're going to do digital transformation. And we're going to do sprints. And we're going to now have dashboards and everything be measured. What's, what happens to the customer? Do they get farther or closer away to the organization? Farther away. This is what happens. This is actually what the modern organization looks like. It's still business as usual, but it's now encased in this membrane of big data technology with dashboards from all these like data science companies that all the big four consulting firms have recommended every company buy. And the company is still doing the same thing. The people at the bottom are still making the same reports to send up to the people at the top to make the decisions who have no idea what the customer is doing. And as a result, this is the hard reality that we've arrived at for this paradox that we see inside organizations is that organizations be can become less customer-centric when they invest in data and technology to better understand their customers. Because these organizations are using technology as a magical tool to replace understanding, to replace understanding, and not as a tool to activate understanding. So keep in mind that these problems persist at companies using a wide variety of tool sets, you know, supported by functionally limitless budgets and armies of consultants using methodologies and frameworks like Agile and design thinking and Lean. And, and talking through our experiences from product and research for Matt and I, you know, what we saw at all these large and small companies is that they're using every conceivable tool possible, every framework. And is it these frameworks' fault? No. It's not like there's something wrong with lean or agile or sprint-based work. It becomes so clear that the problem stopping companies from innovating isn't, they're not technology problems. They're human problems. And as such, they can't be solved by technology alone or adopting some kind of sprint-based approach alone or just bringing in agile or digital transformation. And this is what's brought us to this critical question that uh, we're obsessed with answering, which is how do we empower humans in a data-driven world? Because we can quantify, we can collect, we can store and query all the data there is, but if we don't know how to use it to turn the data into insights, then what use is it? And that's the question we've set out to answer. And I'm going to share with you uh, three, some of those answers that we have incorporated into our work and how we've built that into our practice to actively work with our partners deep into the guts of the organizations to actively undo the quantification bias. So the first thing, there's three things I'll share. So the first thing is that we must empower humans in the data-driven world to operationalize the difference between optimization and discovery. This means that at every level of the organization, we need to have a clear sense of what we're doing and why, and we need to choose our practices and approaches and methods accordingly. You know, operationalizing this difference is how we resolve the tension around what we were seeing in this gap between the rhetoric of innovation and the reality of optimization. And we're gonna show you in the following workshop, well, I'll show you in the following workshop after this on how we operationalize this difference. But for now, I'm gonna share just a quick, you know, quick story of how we implemented this with a streaming music service company. So during a discovery-led qualitative sprint, um, something we're gonna talk about soon, is we asked uh, participants to show us where they put music, where they put the music app on their phone. And not surprisingly, people had already organized their apps into folders. But then we heard a response that was really interesting, that changed the way we looked at our existing data and the quantitative data and the way we had even programmed, the way the engineers had created the algorithm. So we use, by the way, these methods on all sorts of data projects, whether we're building AI or blockchain or just like doing customer analytics or working on ad tech or programmatic stuff in marketing. So, in this case, it was just to make sure that the way that they were, uh, com w it was to make some changes in the algorithm. And in this case, we heard a response and someone said, well, it looks like my music folder doesn't have any music apps in it. And we we're like, why is that? And that person said, it's all podcast apps. And soon after that, we started to see this as a pattern and we started to actually change this qualitative insight of, that was very discovery based made us realize that there was this was hugely impactful for this company's strategy because they soon realized that their biggest competitor wasn't other music apps. That rather the things that people do with their precious time and attention was their competitor 
and more specifically, it was podcasts. And people on this team said that they would have never even bothered to ask that question to say, hey, where do you put your music at? Because they said, you know, it would have been too open-ended and it would have been too seemingly focused on something specific. And they would, they would have said, we would rather focus on specific in-app behavior as opposed to asking a big discovery level question of like, hey, where do you put your music at? Because they're like, we would have thought we already would have known the answer. So they wouldn't have seen this emergent behavior. And this insight proved really, really impactful because then they said, look, we now know that uh, now that people, we know people do this, it actually changed their business and it was so transformative that they shifted their entire strategy to now include podcasts into the work they do. So you, some of you may know this company. Um, it's on your phone, likely. We all use it. Most of us use it. And this is the only kind of business changing transformative insight that would have come out of doing discovery based work rather than falling into the relentless incremental optimization work masquerading as innovation. And in addition, let me remind you, this company has spent a lot of effort launching their personas over the last year. None of that work surfaced this behavior because it wouldn't have fit in that persona because a lot of the way people interact is based on modes, and modes of behaviors can be transversal depending on context. And so they had fallen into thinking, well, why didn't our personas tell us this? Like, because it's persona work. Persona work is another way of, um, a qualitative way of putting people into quantitative segmentations. The second thing we must do to empower humans in a data-driven world is to integrate qualitative and quantitative data. And this is how we resolve the gap between the rhetoric of being data-driven and the reality of being quantitatively data-driven. Now, both qualitative and quantitative data can be hugely valuable when you integrate them. But, and that's really the most important point. It's not that they're valuable on their own. It is more valuable when you bring them together. Now, quanti um, quantitative data is often referred to as big data. So you must have also heard, you may have also heard the term thick data, which is also how we refer to qualitative data. Um, I created the term and to make it sound more sexy than big data, because I really wanted data scientists, when I was sitting in rooms of data scientists and engineers who only wanted to see numbers and they would call my data, my data sets small and puny, I was like, you know what? If you have big data, then I have thick data. And now they actually want the thick data. And so this is a term that I've given to the world, so please use it. There's a lot of writing about it online. I see job descriptions now for people calling for, you know, we're hiring thick data researchers, so, so which is a total success because people don't even know where the term originated from, which means it's definitely being used out there in the world. So for companies to have a full picture, they need the depth of qualitative insights. You get a small N, right, but you get really high depth. And you also really need to have big data, uh, quality, quantitative data, where you get a big N, but you get a low depth of meaning. And what do I mean by that? So here is a slide that we, that's taken out of our workshops. Um, here's a side by side that illustrates why this integration is critical. You know, for big data, you're using, you're leveraging machine intelligence, but for thick data, you're really leveraging human intelligence. For what big data offers you is content and scale. That's unbelievable. But to get all that content at that scale, you have to standardize, you have to scrub, you have to normalize, you have to cluster. All that just rips out the context and depth. So you have to integrate it with thick data to bring back the contextual loss that happens from making quantitative data useful and analyzable. And with big data, you get a lot of what's. When you get statistics, you get, well, 30% of people are doing this at this time. The minute you ask, why did they do this? Why? You have to eventually go back to the thick data. There's no way to avoid it. And the amazing thing about quantitative data is that you get a lot of knowns. It's telling you, you know, things that you already should be understanding. But it's limited in that it cannot tell you things that are emergent. And if anyone here is obsessed with systems theory and emergence theory, then you know that we live in a dynamic system and there's always unknown things happening all the time. And so this is why we also need to have thick data. But somehow, in the era of being data-driven and digital transformation and innovation, 
organizations have decided, hey, we don't need that thick data, those qualitative people, those researchers, those you know, people who go understand them, like understand humans, we're just really going to spend all of our money hiring data scientists. And we're going to put them in room and they're going to help us grow our business. And so they've gone on these hiring sprees and these new department, you know, new department creating sprees. And this is where most of the money and resources, this is where the decisions are being made on this side of the, the room, you know, with, which is on big data. And what this means is that this is, I think, really scary. And which side do you think your organization is on? Is it more on the quantitative side, on more of the qualitative side, or are you guys equally balanced? You know, I just ask you to think about that for a moment of where you might be. And so during our workshop, we're going to give a framework called integrated data thinking, and I'll show it to you in a bit in a second, a preview of it, but um, of how we integrate big and thick data. But here's a quick story of how this actually comes out, plays out in real life. You know, a few years, a few years ago, we were working with O'Reilly Media, a technical publisher of you know all those books with animals. We all know them, right? Um, this is how many of us, if you code or if you um, work on databases, like early ones, they, you see all their books everywhere. And as a tech leader, they were really struggling to fill the seats at their conferences, like Velocity, Strata, you know, all their big um, tech gatherings, and their quantitative data couldn't tell them what was going on. It just couldn't. Like Roger Margolis, who actually coined the term big data, is their head of data, and said, look, I've done all the queries. I, for some reason, cannot figure out why our conference attendance is dropping. Like, why are we not getting seats filled in as usual? And so we ran some qualitative sprints with them, teaching them how to do it themselves. So we modeled it for them. Again, operating, being clear that, look, we're going to move to the discovery level, not the optimization level. And what we found is that within many corporations, people's budgets are explicitly tied to one word. Do you know what that one word is for conference budgets? Training. That's all. That's all it is. And so we found this out within one day in a sprint. And it's that their conference workshops weren't getting results because they had called, were calling them workshops and not training because people's L&D budgets were connected to training. And, we, and it was just like so simple, but they couldn't, their perception of reality was different from the people who were working inside companies. So we identified some quick actions that we could take to change the wording on their site, and ticket sales went up immediately. And on top of that, this critical qualitative insight made their quantitative data even more valuable. We went in and we helped them redo their quantitative surveys to help them better understand the scale and size because we're like, actually, your reach is even bigger if you're actually tying your product to trainings and not workshops. And last but not least, as the third thing to do to bridge this gap of making or of making humans, empowering humans in a data-driven world, is we must bring decision makers and customers closer together. This is beyond critical, and it's one of the most important ways we can empower both the humans we work with, you know, our colleagues, and the humans we serve, which is our customers. This is how we resolve the break in reality between the rhetoric of customer obsession and the reality of tool obsession. You know, when we return back to this image of the modern organization, what we noticed before, right, is that the customer is at the bottom. But there's another thing that's happening that is so normalized that it's just how things work at most companies. You know, when we look at the customer being farthest away, you know, one of the things that Matt, you know, my business partner Matt LeMay realized, and he's written, in his, uh, written about in his book for Agile for Everybody, he describes this reality as a characteristic of most modern organizations. The people whose decisions impact customers the most are the ones who interact with customers the least. WTF, like what, how can this be possible? This is so ingrained that it's just an implicit benefit of getting promoted of like, yes, the higher up I move, the less time I'll spend with customers and the more I can get demand for people to make PowerPoints for me. And then I'll make decisions through PowerPoints and I don't have to go into the field because you know what, UX researchers and those researchers, they go into the field, they have to go write the customer notes up. Then they're gonna make that into a, like a PowerPoint to tell me what a decision I can make this is totally convoluted and this is totally bizarre because this is the source of disconnect between what companies perceive their customers want and what customers actually want, how they act and how they live. And ultimately, it is their customers who determine whether the companies succeed or fail, whether a startup has a next round or a next series. 
You know, we believe this so strongly that decision makers need to interact with customers uh, directly and customer data directly. So that we, because we believe this, you know, customers and people and the people working in companies live very different lives. So one of the things that we did in one of our um, earliest case studies when we were working with a large CPG company based out of the Midwest, they said, look, we want to expand to urban markets. And for the executives at the company, they want to sell more laundry detergents in urban markets. And for the executives, this is what their laundry rooms look like. You know, and has anyone here ever done laundry in New York City or San Francisco? Does it look anything like this? Nope. <laughs> Not at all. And so it looks like it looks like this. This is what the reality is. For all their data that they had, they had, they could not understand that their customers were actually doing laundry in places that looked like this until we told them, pack your bags, you're gonna leave your Midwestern town, and you're gonna go to Brooklyn for a week. These are executives who manage the PL. These are GMs who we told you have to get up and leave. And I cannot overstate how uncomfortable they were. I had to even tell them, please don't wear your suits to the laundromat, but we're gonna go to the laundromat together. You're gonna bring your dirty clothes. You're not gonna send it out. No, and they happen to be men. I'm like, no, your wife is not gonna do it. You know, you're gonna do your laundry. And they had to leave their comfortable, cushy offices and talk to people in a setting where they weren't the boss and they actually could not pretend they knew everything. And what they found out was amazing because they said, look, we thought our entire marketing plan was created for our laundrom laundromats, like thinking that people do laundry in something that looks like this. And the concept was around convenience. And they're like, we know it doesn't work because it didn't make sense for their urban customers who ended up finding a way to make these experiences actually valuable, which is the way they do their laundry. And what we heard from people, some people were saying, look, I come here to do my laundry in Brooklyn. This is the only time I can get away from my partner. Or this is the only time I have to myself. <laughs> This is the only time I go with my kids. This is the only time I can read a book. This is the only time I call my mother. This is, and, and one of the most fascinating points we heard, we were like, why is everyone so dressed up? And what we realized, we're like, actually, it's also a physical Tinder spot. This is also the best hookup spot in Brooklyn, apparently, because everyone was always looking good. And so we're like, look, these are things that you would have never found out through any of your surveys, through any of your Ipsos work, through any quantitative data, any of your third party data that you would have bought. You would have never know that people have found, not that like they love doing laundry, but people have found a way to make the experience valuable on their way, in their way. Right? And so based on this direct interaction, they redirect their entire marketing campaign within one week, something that would have taken several months or what they said it might have been impossible to change because they would have said, well, we've already made the plan, so we can't change it now because we've got our agency partners. And by the way, we brought the agency with them so they could experience it too. And so there was no excuse in the book because everybody was there. And it only took one week, which is very hard, but it saved them much more time in the end. And then they made, um, it was 300 million in revenue in just the first year based on this uh, campaign switch. So to summarize, these are the three answers we've come up with in our, come up with in our five years of working as some of the top most important things to do to empower humans in a data-driven world, to resolve all those gaps between rhetoric and reality, you know, operationalize the difference between uh, discovery and optimization. Uh, op and then second is integrate qualitative and quant. And the third is bring decision makers closer to the customer. And you may have noticed one of the key words here is operationalize. And we believe that this is so important that we put this into our practice because it's not just enough to say these things. You actually have to find a way to get people to do this. You know, one of the major challenges in operationalizing these ideas is that most modern organizations continue to work in silos. So broadly speaking, you've got your marketing folks, and then you've got your product folks, and then you've got your business folks, and then whatever other departments you have. You know, it could be like sales or finance or design. And then marketing usually has very pronounced silos. Um, you have silos within silos, right? Like marketing has like performance marketing, branding agency, and then imagine it happens the same thing within each silo. And it was really clear to us that each silo had their own frameworks, their own language, their own, own consultants that they wanted to bring in. And it was clear that from the outset, however we operationalize these ideas we've discussed, it needed to bring people together and to bridge these silos and not make it worse. And so we've spoken a little bit about the sprints that we run in our work, and we call them unlock sprints. And they represent our attempt to uh, operationalize 
our three ideas, you know, um, how to empower humans in a data-driven world into an easy, accessible, and repeatable practice that anyone, literally anyone can do. So we took the best practices out there from, you know, I used to do some work with IDEO, so I took the best practices from design thinking. I've done a lot of Agile. I took the best of Agile. Matt has done tons of Agile and Lean. And we just took the best of everything that we learned from everyone, you know, mo many of you here today. And we said, we're going to just create such a simple, easy four-step process. We're not going to call it anything fancy because there's already great things like Agile and Lean out there and design thinking. We're just going to say these are the four steps to do, and you can customize it the way you need and, you know, for your organization. And the idea here is pretty simple. You know, it's getting a cross-functional group together, including decision makers, to ask a mission-critical business question, to acquire the diversity, the diversity of data needed to answer that question, to analyze that data together, and to act. And that last step is so important to make a decision on what to act on. And over the last five years, we've iterated on this practice a number of times, and we wanted to share one particular important part of it with you today, um, right now, uh, before I end my talk, because I know not all of you can do be part of the lab. So I wanted to share one step that I think is critical that I think, I, I think that everyone can take, and I would love to know how would you incorporate into your work. And this is the thing that we'll be sharing and open sourcing and putting on Google um, Design Sprint's site. And so if you notice here, there is a critical step that happens between one and two, between ask and acquire. And there's something that has to happen for people to acquire the right data. And so we created a framework to get people to think about quantitative and qualitative data along with discovery and optimization in a different way. And so we created a framework called integrated data thinking. And it unifies a way to work with both quantitative and qualitative data and discovery and optimization. And when I developed this framework, framework five years ago, I remember calling my mentor, Roger Magolas, who coined the term big data. And I was like, I think I found the unifying theory for how to get organizations to work with data. And I, can, I think it's so easy that anyone can learn, even if you're not a data scientist or a trained ethnographer, that anyone you know, can just do this. And this is the exact framework that I had been missing even as a grad student where I've studied both statistics and ethnography. So we're going to dive into this in detail in the lab, but real quick, I just want to show you what it is so that you can get a sense of how to potentially even use it. The first x-axis operationalizes the distinction between optimization and discovery. Right, so you have discovery on one end and you have optimization, which is finding known things. Discovery is about finding unknown new things. And then the y-axis represents the integration. For at the top, you have thick data, which is qualitative, and the bottom, which is big data, quantitative. And what this does is it allows us to map the questions we're asking in each quadrant, thereby exposing the type of data that must be gathered. So notice that I'm going to be questions-led and not methods-led. For example, if we were working with a company that builds boats, we could have a question that lands us in the discovery qual quad quadrant, like what does mobility mean to people? This is like a why discovery unknown question, right? So of course you're gonna be up in the top left corner where you'll be in employing tools like ethnography. We could have a question that landed us in the more qualitative optimization quadrant, like what would the ideal boat for most people include? And then we would move down into a question that was more quantitative discovery quadrant, like, well, what are some common interests shared by people who buy boats? There we could actually, if we had an amazing data set already, we could do some emergent clustering analysis because big data or quantitative data, it, it, there's a range. There's more discovery-based techniques and there's more optimization-based techniques, right? Or we could have a question that lands us more in the quant optimization quadrant, like at what price point does a boat feel like an accessible purchase? Which you can also just also move into a qualitative um, optimization too if you want to run a focus group. So there's different ways you can play with this. But the point is, is that we could also run an intense survey and find out exactly at what medium or at what is a point where you have a most statistically you know, relevant point of distinction. What's important here is that the question is guiding all future decisions about the methodology and data. So when it comes to our time to choose a methodology and run the remaining steps of the sprint, it's based on the question we were asking in the first place, not the method. So this allows our partners to rapidly move between quantitative and qualitative methodologies and optimization and discovery as their questions change. 
So ideally for any one product to be built, we are working with anywhere from 30 to 100 to 200 sprints. And for large teams, they can be running parallel sprints. You can have one sprint team that's both qual and quant together. You can have data scientists and ethnographers on one team, or you might want to split your teams to say, we're going to have just like the engineers on one team, and we're going to have the UX researchers on another. It totally depends on the project, or you can have all of it on one project. So what you can have multiple parallel sprints. We use this framework, integrated data thinking, along with unlock sprints, to work on a variety of projects that require the integration of big and thick data. And these projects require engineers to work with ethnographers on improving, like let's say an algorithm, on building an entirely new app. Or these are the kind of practices that force people to actually work together on one team and to understand the value that the other, you know, the other kinds of expertise, domain expertise is bring. And what's really amazing is that what we see is that people who are usually uncomfortable, like you know, you, we see ethnographers or UX researchers or market researchers be like, oh, sometimes I'm really uncomfortable because I'm not trained as a data scientist. They actually become more comfortable working with them. And vice versa, we see data scientists and engineers who are like, wow, I never knew that my work could be so connected to the human element and that I could actually join some of these sprints and be you know, really clear about how a qualitative insight affects how I weight an algorithm. And actually, an ethnographer is going to help me figure out how I weight something, a variable. That's amazing. So we, we see total transformations and how products are being built and how you know, even variables are being weighted. Now, when we work with our partners, we often find that they have some other sprint-based you know, approach that they've already been using, which is because we have an amazing community like you guys already spreading the word and teaching companies how to do this. And so that's why over the last five years, so what we're doing is we white label all of our work. That's why it's not a fancy name. It's just unlock sprints, and we tell companies, Call it whatever you want, insert it to whatever is existing work you want, smash it up. Some companies have created eight steps out of this, right? It's entirely different. And many of our partners just end up completely changing it and just figuring out what's best for them. And we're totally cool with that because at the end of the day, we believe it's not the tool that matters the most, it's the people. And whatever language, whatever names you want to call it, that what's more important is how do you get people in the room to communicate around data. So coming back to the original question that we started with five years ago, we're still answering this question, which is, you know, how do we empower humans in a data-driven world? And while we continue to iterate on principles and practices, this is the most important question that we want to answer. Is this is we have to empower, you know, humans together. And I'm sure many of you in attendance know this better here in this room better than anyone else that you know part the magic of sprints is not the sprints it's the people it's the sprint master doing the work it's the attendees in the room and that's why I'm really happy to be here in this community with you guys thank you so much <laughs>